Today we're going to talk about an old cathode ray tube TV. It's a Sony Trinitron uh, model KV2765 from 1980. Okay, so this is a Trinitron tube. It comes with a, uh, a thick glass front. And what it has is a, an electron gun at the back that fires three colors, red, green, and blue. And they go through a Trinitron um, mask. And what it is is it's a little piano frame with vertical wires. And what those wires do is they split the beam into the three separate colors, the red, blue, and green. And there's vertical lines on this TV with phosphorus on the back side of the glass that will illuminate when those guns hit it. And the uh, screen is constantly scanning back and forth uh, 60 times a second, which is based on the available power we have uh, here in North America. So with the 60 hertz refresh rate, the TV is constantly cycling back and forth uh, to get the uh, picture onto the phosphorus on the back. So essentially it's a glow-in-the-dark uh, coating on the back of the TV uh, that's being excited and illuminated by a gun in the back of the TV that's constantly firing. Now these guns do emit a little bit of radiation so on older cathode ray tube TVs uh, the glass will be a leaded glass like a crystal but on this newer TV, it would be a barium style glass on the inside to keep the um, <coughs> radiation from coming out. And on the outer part of the glass would just be uh, regular glass. But the glass on the front of these tubes is quite thick. It would be like um, half inch to uh, you know three quarters of an inch thick. So it contributed to these heavies, or TVs being very heavy. So this TV as it stands right now weighs about 110 pounds. And it's largely due to the, the glass on the front and the Trinitron uh, frame inside, but mostly the glass. Um, controls on the TV are fairly simple. It's got power button, two speakers, you know, volume control, channel control, TV video control, and the timer button. But um, I hit that with a vacuum many years ago and busted it off. Uh, inside are the um, more detailed controls, uh, you know, your brightness and color and hue and picture uh, control and then you can also cycle between cable on and off but also it has the uh, add and erase for channels so that you can erase channels so if you uh, were cycling through if there was something missing on one of the channels you could erase that channel so when you flip through the channels you wouldn't have to go past a, a dead channel okay uh, so I've got a VCR here so I'll just play a little bit and um, to avoid any copyright infringement, this is my dad teaching a class uh, back in the day. So you can see the picture quality is pretty good, and I don't know if in the movie camera here you're going to actually see the 60 hertz refresh rate, but even by waving your hand in front you can sort of see the uh, cycling effect of the gun scanning across the back of the screen. But um, also with these older TVs, you get a, there's a transformer inside, and I can't remember what the name of the transformer is, but it produces a really high pitched whine. So I remember when I was uh, younger, you, when you walked into a house, you could tell if a TV was on because it was emitting this high-pitched whine. It's about 16,000 hertz, but um, you can definitely hear it. It's a really high-pitched whine. But I mean, the audio isn't bad on the TV. I mean, these are the built-in speakers. But um, yeah, so these TVs, I mean, they were extremely heavy and durable. And this was the gold standard at the time, was the Trinitron TV. And again, it was because of that Trinitron mask in the back. And what competing TVs had was a thin metal screen behind the phosphorus-coated screen that had little slits in it or little dots in it. So the electron guns would only come through those holes. But the comp what the issue was was trying to make the picture nice and bright. So that's what the Trinitron uh, helped achieve. Okay, here's a close-up of the Trinitron logo in the upper left corner. Again, it's sh er, showing the red, green, and blue. Uh, those are the three colors that are um, projected by the guns to make the picture on the screen. So if you're going to get a white, it would be all of those very intense. And if you're going to get a black, all three. And here's off. a close-up of the model number. Again, it's the KV2765R. I don't know what the R means, but uh, there it is. And again, here's a close-up of the uh, buttons inside uh, that you can see with the various functions like hue and brightness. And here's control. a close-up of the main buttons. Again, power, channel, volume, TV video, and timer block. And yeah, I busted that off with a vacuum. Still feel bad about that. 
And then up here were the status LEDs where you'd have, um, if you had like a stereo signal or if you had uh, the video mode. Okay, this is going to be really difficult to see, but um, what I'm trying to show here is the vertical uh, lines in the um, Trinitron TV picture tube. And uh, that was a characteristic of the, the Trinitron, because again, it was like a, a piano frame with vertical wires that would divide the um, uh, electron gun um, out onto the back of the screen. But it's very difficult to see here, because I can't quite get the camera to focus in close enough. But hopefully it comes through um, that you can see the, the, the vertical lines, which are very characteristic of a Trinitron. Uh, other TVs would have a series of three dots, or you'd have a series of uh, little squares with the um, three vertical lines in there. But, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things with the tube. And again, I was talking about how the front of the tube is very thick. That was also really helpful because the tube is under uh, a vacuum. So if there was any trauma to the front of the tube, like if it was smashed, it would actually implode. And what would happen is all the glass would come in and the implosion then come back out again. So it would be quite dangerous to damage hey, the tube. Another interesting aspect to the uh, cathode ray tubes is the um, uh, sensitivity of the electron gun uh, pattern to magnets. So if you had a, a magnet close to the TV you could see it would really mess with the picture. And uh, why this happens is it's imparting a magnetic field into the screen. Um, and so the beams of electrons are actually being influenced one side or the other when they hit the screen, which is no good because it messes up the color. So this TV was built with a degaussing circuit so that would automatically um, degauss the screen every time the TV was turned on. However, it's not very powerful, so it would take a long time to fully degauss the screen. But that's why it was important to keep magnets away from it because, you know, it would be messing up the picture if you're forever paying with magnets near the TV. But um, this TV was serviced about 10 years ago uh, for an issue where it had some discoloration that wouldn't go away and it was revealed that the degaussing circuit actually was never hooked up from the factory and uh, corrected my uh, color issue. But this TV has been in mothballs for 10 years so it's time to move on but um, it's uh, served us well. Um, but yeah, that was the only time it was ever in for service was because it wasn't degaussing. A um, couple other things to note on the TV is it would get very staticky um, and another neat trick you could do is uh, if it was dark you could take like a, a flashlight and you could shine the flashlight on the picture tube and you could actually see the phosphorus behind the tube uh, glow uh, because of the light so you'd get like a faint uh, green glow because um, essentially it's glow in the dark material and when you had the flashlight in the dark you could see a pattern that you'd leave on the tube. So more features with this TV are uh, molded in handles which are important since the TV weighs 110 pounds so moving these things is always a bear and the depth of the TV is always astounding with the cathode ray tube because again you have the tube up back that's shooting the image forward and so this is actually not that deep this was a later model that had a shorter cathode ray tube but I mean the depth of the TV is astounding I mean you know this is coming in at about 21 inches and the front of the TV itself the total width of this whole thing is 26 and a half inches, which is amazing. And I always found that perplexing too, how the picture size was always dictated by a diagonal measurement. So that's how I ended up with the 27 inches for this 27 inches. Okay, here's the back of the TV. Uh, by today's standard, there's really not a whole heck of a lot going on here. Um, you've got the cable antenna input, and then you've also got your video input from a VCR, and then your audio output that you would uh, wire to... Uh, you know, a preamp or an amplifier if you want to have a stereo. Sound. Now let's take the back off and have a look inside. Now in all fairness, I'm going to be getting a bit out of my depth here, but I uh, just wanted to let everyone have a look at what was inside. Now again, this is, uh, you want to be safe here, you know, it's not plugged in. I'm going to go out of my way to not touch any capacitors because they could still have uh, charge on them quite a while later. But point out interesting things back here. This is the um, back of the tube. This is the um, uh, electrical shield around it. This is um, part of the uh, picture tuning, I believe. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a transformer that's responsible for that 16,000 um, 
uh, Hertz wine uh, with the TV. And um, when I had this TV serviced, it was fascinating because the fellow who uh, serviced the TV didn't take the whole TV. He actually disassembled it and took the bottom board by itself and uh, took it away to have it repaired and brought it back. And okay, and um, when they built the TVs, I do know that a lot of work went into uh, tuning the picture. And uh, there's magnets here uh, that are used to help uh, tune uh, the picture at the factory. And uh, you'll notice the depth of this cathode ray tube is actually quite shallow, and that's because this was a, a later example of a CRT style TV. Earlier TVs weren't able to be this shallow, and I know this doesn't look shallow, but the earlier TVs were quite a bit deeper. And, um, you know, this is, you know, very high end for its time. And, um, I don't know, there's really not too much uh, that I'm able to point out that's interesting here. But I'm fairly certain um, electrical folks out there would be able to identify a number of fascinating things here. But here we go. Here's a car. view of the interior from the other side. And um, this label's interesting. It um, talks about uh, X-ray radiation four times. So I guess, uh, yeah, it's a pretty big deal on this. And also notes that uh, this TV actually is, um, I believe it says, 28 kilovolts um, inside here. So again, it's a fairly significant electrical hazard, but um, by this time, when the Trinitrons were out, it was pretty rare that you need anyone to service the TV. They were really robust. And um, yeah, it was in constant operation from 1987 to 2007, so it was a solid 20 years. And again, it just got to the point where um, the bigger TVs were cheap by around 2007, so we retired this TV and moved on to... Um, uh, a plasma, or sorry, not a plasma, we did an LED TV. And uh, interestingly enough, we've been running that TV for, you know, uh, 13 years now. So, you know, we're getting a really good life out of our new TV. But it's fascinating at this time that, you know, this was the uh, pinnacle of technology and this is what it looked like in 1987. So it's a bit awkward to see because it's upside down, but yeah, the TV comes in at 109 pounds, which is a hefty TV. So, yeah, these things were always a pain. Okay, but... here's the uh, owner's manual for the Sony 27-inch Trinitron TV. And uh, here's the receipt uh, from A&B Sound. Uh, this is where my brother bought the TV during the Boxing Day sale at A&B Sound. They used to do a big sale every uh, year, the day after Christmas. So you can see here, it's December 26, 1987. And my brother paid uh, $1,298 for the TV. And there's a the model number there, KV2765 and uh, 6% tax, so this TV came out to $1,375. So in 1987, that was a fair bit of money. And in today's money, so $2020, that uh, $1,375 would come out to about $3,100. And that'd be enough for like a 75-inch uh, Sony Bravia 4K TV uh, today. But, uh, you know, at the time this was a really good TV, so, you know, it makes sense that uh, you'd have to spend that money. And again, being the uh, Trinitron, that was the premier TV at the time. So this would make sense that, you know, it All right, let's uh, go through the manual for the 27-inch uh, Sony Trinitron. So um, on the front here, you can just see it shows the TV and the remote controller. And uh, on the table of contents here, it'll give you your uh, typical warnings. Um, you know, don't clean it with gasoline. Uh, you know, uh, don't electrocute yourself. You know, solid advice. Um, and then it's got a series of uh, features which are interesting um, when you read them today. Um, so things like this uh, micro black Trinitron picture tube. Um, at the time it was really difficult to get a, a truly black black unless you turn the brightness down so that they're, you know, the picture was almost hard to see. But that's what uh, Trinitron was trying to solve was to have a, a bright picture but to give you relatively true blacks without a lot of color bleeding. So they have a lot of uh, trademarks in here. They're talking about dynamic color, dynamic picture, and color pure filter. Again, it's all in an effort to give you a, a bright picture uh, that's clear. And uh, with the cathode ray tube, that was always the holy grail. It's difficult to achieve, but Sony Trinitron at the time um, was the leader in uh, getting you a good picture. And again, during the 80s, it was really interesting because they were going from um, what we called a screen mask which was like a, a very thin metal sheet with perforations in it uh, that the colors would come through. 
whereas the Trinitron was more like um, a piano frame where you'd have strings of uh, uh, wire effectively uh, that would uh, cal the, uh, the cathode ray guns would shoot through to give you the color and uh, they'd project be projected onto the back of the tube where there's phosphorus which would glow in the uh, green, blue, and red. Uh, but anyway, other features it has is a tuner with 125 channels, which again, by today, seems like a strange thing to talk about. But in the 80s, that's when they came up with uh, digital converters where you'd have your old TV with the dial with 13 channels and the converter would allow you to go up to I can't remember what it was, it was on like 67 channels, or probably 99, since the display only had two digits. But this TV had it built in, so you had a built-in converter in the TV, which was great. So if you had uh, access to cable, you'd be able to get as many channels as they had available. Uh, and I believe at the time, I don't remember anyone that had 125 channels. And then they had the um, MTS, um, which was important in uh, the states where you had uh, TV channels that would broadcast on Spanish and English. So you could use the MTS to switch between the uh, Spanish audio and the um, uh, English audio. And I believe in the future it became called SAP. Oh, actually it says right there, SAP, Second Audio Program. And then it had some really neat features that I like, like this um, timer block. Uh, that allowed you to actually turn the TV into an alarm clock. So it would actually turn on at a preset time. And then if you were watching TV while you were going to bed, you could set it so that it would just shut off an hour after you went to sleep. And then, you know, a remote control, which, you know, at the time was getting more popular, but it was good to have. Okay, and this is us talking about um, uh, the operation of the TV. So it's showing you the LEDs on the front face that would show you, you know, if you were on VCR or video mode. Uh, if the timer was going or if you had stereo on that channel. And then um, also the functions for adding and erasing channels. So again on your converter you can actually er erase a channel so that when you flip through your channels you wouldn't have to go past dead channels so you could just delete them. And then uh, you know everything's documented here so get my hand out of the way so you can read it if you're interested. Okay and then on the next page uh, we've got the remote control, um, which was uh, becoming really popular in the 80s. By 1987, pretty much everything you bought would have one. Um, then also shows the RCA jacks in the back of the TV. Uh, you've got the um, input jacks from uh, VCR, so you'd have the video and the left and right audio channels. And then you also had audio output, so you could uh, wire those to uh, a preamp uh, if you wanted to get... Uh, uh, stereo sound out of uh, external speakers and then they also had the uh, antenna which would be your cable connection and then on the uh, remote it's uh, showing various functions it's also got uh, a, a jump which was really nice so with the jump button you could uh, flip between two TV stations so if you were watching uh, network TV and uh, commercial came on then you could flip to another uh, station with a show that you wanted to watch probably not as badly as the first show, and then you could estimate uh, how long it would take for the commercials to be over and then flip back to the original channel. And then on the remote, most of the features that are on the TV were replicated on the remote. So like uh, the timer feature um, to turn your TV into an alarm clock, and then the sleep feature is also um, in the remote so that you could have the TV automatically turn itself off uh, if you're watching TV um, while you're in bed. And then uh, Nothing too special, it just uses AA batteries, and um, one of the issues with the remotes is the batteries would die, and um, people would be under the impression that if you bent the remote or if you tweaked it a certain way, you could uh, make it work. But very often the batteries were just dead, so yeah, you know a lot of the remotes suffered a lot of abuse needlessly when it was really just batteries that needed to be replaced. And, um, you know, remotes would get lost and end up getting thrown in the garbage if they're left in a newspaper or something. But, um, yeah, the remote was uh, with this TV um, for its whole life, so it worked okay. Um, let's see what's on the next page. Oh, okay, so this is the, um, just how to use the TV. So it's just talking about, you know, the uh, using the power button to turn it on. That's, you know, good advice. Um... And then we were talking previously about the uh, second audio program um, for 
certain TV stations, again, it was a big thing in the States where you'd have simultaneous broadcasts. So you'd have the same video, but you'd have English on one audio channel and Spanish on another audio channel. So this shows you how to flip through the different uh, audio programs. And then down here is the cable TV channel chart. Um, pretty meaningless today, but um, back in the day, if um, you had a cable company that had uh, different channels, I believe this chart could be used to figure out um, what your channel on the TV represented um, with what the cable uh, provider was offering. Okay. And um, so we are talking earlier about uh, the old dial TVs before they had a converter. So those were the regular VHF channels, the channel 2 to channel 13. And then um, with the remote or with the TV you could add or erase channels which was great. Because not every channel was broadcasting something. So back in the day we would have uh, channels 2 through 13 and then we'd also have channel 20 and 21. So you'd want to delete channels 14 to 19 because there was nothing on there. But as years passed, those channels started filling up. And uh, But it was handy, because when you'd have the remote, you could just flip through the channels, and you wouldn't have to flip through dead channels. And then, yeah, the TV had a clock, which, again, uh, made sense, because if you are going to use the TV as an alarm clock, you'd need to have a, its own clock. And then it also had a, a feature that I don't remember ever being used, but you could block certain channels at a certain time. So I, I guess uh, the idea was to keep kids from watching particular channels or something. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but I guess it was like an early V-chip, perhaps. And then just went through the process of how to do everything. Setting the clock, setting the timer, and the channel block. I'll leave that if anyone wants to have a look. Okay. And, oh, this is good. Okay, so it's showing here how you'd uh, use your audio out into um, a preamp or an amplifier, and then you could have external speakers. And when my brother had this TV, he was quite keen on using external speakers, so you get really rich audio. And um, if you didn't want to use a, a VCR into the back, you could actually get uh, FM stations, um, and you could wire the tuner to the TV. Uh, didn't really make sense to me, because I don't know... Um, why you wouldn't uh, just use your FM tuner to uh, grab signals over the air. But uh, the intent here was that you could get um, FM through your cable and then have it come through the TV uh, sound. But again, it doesn't really make sense because usually FM tuners of the silk, you would have um, you know a, a coax input. It wouldn't necessarily be a coax cable, but you'd have the, um, like here, you'd have uh, like an antenna connector um, for your FM. So you would just use a cable like this to go into your tuner. But again, I, I guess it made sense for some folks. Uh, it, that's not the way we used it. What we did is we had the VCR um, plumbed into the external inputs and uh, my brother would use the uh, audio out uh, on his amplifier to get uh, big rich sound. And then um, if you were pulling a TV over the air, uh, you know, you'd have your option of the different antennas and actually even today uh, if you want um, most local radio stations will um, have to broadcast uh, their uh, signals over the air so if you have a really decent uh, UHF antenna you can get high def channels today on any TV and uh, as long as you aim the antenna to where the um, UHF signal is originating uh, you can um, get uh, those digital channels on your TV. But um, it's a little tricky because you have, uh, if you have multiple locations where the signal is coming from, you might need to do uh, or have a shunt built into the signal to have multiple antennas because each antenna would interfere with each other's signal and you get like shadows and ghosting. So, you know, if you only had one antenna, you have to make sure it pointed at your favorite uh, broadcasting location to get your channels. And, um, that's pretty much it. On the back it had the specifications and the troubleshooting. One thing that I find really interesting in the specifications is that power consumption was a maximum 160 watts. So that would be with the sound cranked up and uh, with the TV, you know, really nice and bright. But um, really everything else was um, pretty normal, especially by 
today's standards, I guess. But uh, it's interesting to think that, you know, this was the um, premier technology at the time, back in 1987. Well, thank you for joining me on this discussion about this uh, 1987 Sony Trinitron. Um, you know, I'm sure I've missed uh, probably some important technical aspects or interesting historical aspects. I do know that after the uh, Trinitron patent expired, uh, a bunch of other companies came out with their own version of the Trinitron, but Su uh, Su Sony replaced it with their Vega series, which was uh, extraordinarily heavy. I mean, some of the heaviest TVs ever produced in the uh, hundreds of pounds. I think one of the TVs weighed something close to 300 and some odd pounds. Um, eventually that's what my brother ended up buying and I helped him move that once or twice, but it was just a hellacious nightmare. <laughs> it was just crazy. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you had any stories of your own or if uh, you had any memories you wanted to share, feel free to throw it in the comments and I'd love to see what, uh, folks have to say. So I'll just close out. Here's my dad still teaching his class and I'm still free from copyright infringement. So, uh... Thanks everyone for watching, I really appreciate it, and uh, have a good one.